preview window. Whoops. Yep, that's okay. That's cool. Alright. Okay. Alright, I think I got everything all set up. Okay, cool. We'll see. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I was up late last night. I went to a live show and I'm also a little deaf, so sorry about that. Um, let's see, what kind of folks have we got going on in the chat? Uh, Long Island, uh, Normandy, uh, London, we've got Moscow, first time live. Uh, well, I, we appreciate you showing up. Uh, Windsor, Canada, painting some Titanicus this morning, nice. Uh, greetings from mid-Michigan. Um, let me see, what else we got? North Carolina, Belgium, Budapest, Northeast Michigan, uh, we've got Lumberton, North Carolina, a two-week streak. <clears throat> Excellent. Uh, hello from overly sunny Scotland, not used to the big orange ball and the sky being so bright. Glad to uh, finally catch you live. Well, we're glad to have you here. I was on a, uh, a live show with the folks from Chilling Wargamers uh, this, when was it, on Thursday, and they were not chilling because evidently it was in the 90s Fahrenheit over there and that's not normal for England so they were all not happy about it and I understand why. We've got Venice, we've got Nottingham, we've got Hamilton, Ontario. Hi from London, first time live. Got back to the hobby through watching Tabletop Minions videos. Oh well, great, that's a mission accomplished then. I'm glad to, I'm glad to have helped hopefully. Uh, we've got uh, Penang, we've got uh, Italy, we've got France, we've got Australia. Hello and greetings from Tijuana. Um, Steve says, who played last night? Uh, it's the, it was the Main Street Music Festival uh, downtown, and so there was actually a ton of bands playing last night. Um, I saw Red Shift Headlights, I saw... A band from Indianapolis whose name I can't remember now, but um, it was, they were really good. I saw a band from Wausau, Wisconsin called 20 Watt Tombstone. They were also super good. Um, yeah. Uh, currently kit bashing some corn berserkers because the actual models are old enough to vote. Uh, yes, I think they're almost old enough to get AARP. Um, that's a ret retirement joke. Um, yeah, no, they're they're very old models, and I was really kind of hoping they were going to make new ones soon because the Berserkers now in Eighth Edition are kind of awesome, and so you want to run them, uh, but yeah, they're really really old models. Um, so yeah, that's how that works. Uh, what else have we got? We've got Canada, North Chicago, Perth, New Haven, Connecticut. Hello from relatively cool Dallas, Texas. First time catching you live. Your videos got me back into 8th edition 40k and kills him. Well, great. I'm, I'm glad that, again, that, that uh, I hope that helps. Uh, hello from Belfast. Got my lunch all set. To, ready to enjoy the show. I just had some breakfast because it's time zones. Uh, what else have we got? Um, VJ Morph asks, the question is, were any of the bands last night up to uh, meat jelly level? Uh, during the Tabletop Minions Expo here in town back in the beginning part of June, um, on Saturday night after the Expo shut down, we many of us went to a bar uh, that's owned by uh, a couple of friends of mine, and there were a bunch of bands, and there was a band called Meat Jelly that was there, and everybody enjoyed the name quite a bit. Uh, and I, it, it, these guys were, I think, better than Meat Jelly. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, it's, I, I apologize to the, to the Meat Jelly fans out there, but, uh, you yeah. Uh, Scott says, greetings from Oconomowoc, on the road, heading west to, Virgi to, heading to West Virginia. Well, hopefully you're not, well, if you're driving, don't be watching. There's not a lot really going on on the screen, frankly. So, yeah, um, listening is fine. But um, uh, for those of you in the chat who see that word that starts with an O, it's uh, pronounced Oconomowoc. It's, um, it's, it's a word that's difficult for most people outside of Wisconsin to say, but that's what, it's, that's what it is. It looks like Oconomowoc, but it's actually Oconomowoc. Uh, let me see, what else have we got here? 
Dave Rudin is, says, my fingers are crossed for a full Word Eater codex down the line. Yeah, if they did that, then that would be a super good reason for them to bring back the, uh, or, you know, to make a new uh, set of sculpts for Berserkers. I, I would like to see that. I mean, they made new, like, regular Chaos Marines, so hopefully they'll do Berserkers eventually. That'd be great. Good morning from Brazil, Poland, Houston, Texas. JP Gotrock is checking in from the Pocket Dimension. He has donuts. That's, that's good to hear. I'm glad they were able to get donuts into the Pocket Dimension. Uh, Daniel says, hello from Indianapolis. Who's coming to Gen Con? This guy over here. Um, yeah, I'm going to be going, let me see, leaving on Wednesday morning and driving to Milwaukee and um, parking my car at a friend's house. And then we're taking his car to another friend's house who has a minivan. And then we're going from there to Indianapolis. So I should be there, I don't know, sometime in the early afternoon, I believe. Um, for those of you who are going to be at Gen Con, it looks like the meetup, the Tabletop Minions meetup, such as it is, uh, will probably be sometime later on the evening on Friday, most likely around 8.30ish or so. Um, moderator Matt has said that he should be able to make it. He's running a bunch of RPG stuff for Wreckage, and um, so hopefully he'll be able to make it there. Um, but yeah, it should be Friday evening. And it'll probably be at the Potbelly Sandwich Shop on the Monument Circle, kind of like it has been the last couple of years. So yeah. Um, let me see. Hello from Greece, Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, Jesse Daniels says, morning from Milwaukee. Um, morning from Massachusetts, Liverpool. Jesse says, see you, at a few, see you in a few days at Gen Con. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Legionnaire says, any clue if the new Warcry box is going to be limited release like the first Kill Team box? I don't know. Um, I've not heard anything. I swear I heard somewhere that it was not going to be limited release, that they wanted to, but I don't remember where I heard that from. Like, not from, like, any in industry insight. It's not like I was talking to my contacts, uh, and they were like, oh, no, no, it's going to, it was just, I swear I heard it somewhere, possibly on some other channel or something like this. Um, but I did swear I heard that it wasn't going to be limited release, but uh, it, it's hard to say. Um, I would say it's not as good as a bargain. You know, like, the Kill Team starter box was a really good bargain because you got two armies in there plus all that massive massive amount of terrain, and it was a relatively inexpensive box. I thought it was either it was 130 or 150 bucks. This one being, like, 170 is maybe not quite as good of a bargain, so maybe it's not going to be a limited thing, I, but I've not, I don't know, um, honestly. Oops, sorry, I hit the microphone with my coffee. Kelly Audius says, hello, minions. Good time, or, long time no see. Just settling in for my move from Illinois to Georgia. I missed you guys unpacking hobby stuff today. Nice, Kelly, glad to, glad to hear it. Emily uh, says that she'll be at Gen Con. Cool, cool. Uh, what else? Let me see here. Andrew Fairbanks says, uh, morning from a southwest flight six miles above the Earth's surface. Stop trying to get into other games and finish your Kill Team project. See, the, they always say that you're not supposed to use the... Well, I, maybe they, at, on Delta they always say you're not supposed to use the uh, in-flight Wi-Fi for video um, chat or video streaming. But, you know, maybe it's different on Southwest. I don't know. I've never flown in Southwest. Uh, VJ Morph says, nice green t-shirt. Not a color we see you in often, sir. Yeah, I do generally wear a lot of black. That's true. Or dark colors. This is, um, this is a Pitfall t-shirt, which is probably my earliest favorite video game. First video game probably ever that I actually finished, like got to the end on the old 2600. Um, let's see here. Andrew Endicott says, love these Sundays. I, yeah, well, good. I'm glad, to, I'm glad that, that that works out for you. Brayden says, yo, from Yokohama, Japan. Yo, from Yokohama, nice. King John says, greetings from Amarillo, Texas. Uncle Adam, thank you so very so much for your content. You've helped me jump into the hobby, and now I love painting minis. Well, cool. As I've said, I don't know how many times before, I think it's a really good hobby, even just the painting part, because it becomes very, it's a stress reliever, it's almost meditative, at least I find it to be. Uh, you're sitting there and focusing on something with your hands, you can be listening to audiobooks, listening to podcasts, listening to videos, uh, things like that. Some people listen to TV shows on Netflix or whatever, but it, um, 
it just kind of like helps to sort of dial things in a little bit. So, yeah. Um, hello from Romania. Nice. What else? Hey, Adam, did you enjoy our surprise rattle can weather earlier this week? It was great down in the Texas coast. Uh, yeah, we've not... Well, the weather was okay this week here. Um, there was some rain uh, last week just before the um, live uh, irregular show. This big thunderstorm was coming through and it hit like minutes before the show and our, there, we needed to get our gutters cleaned and stuff and there was just water running off the house and it was landing right next to the house. So um, my wife and I ran outside and threw down some tarps so hopefully it wouldn't soak in the basement too much and everything and then I looked so the the show started a touch late but I, I looked a bit like a drowned rat so um yeah miniature misfit says I, I have to live vicariously I can't get to Gen Con here's hoping for vids and pics from everyone I will be posting stuff on um Instagram and I'm also gonna probably try I'm gonna try to do some videos actually from the show not live videos like this I, instead, what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to try. Uh, I picked up some editing software for the iPad that is surprisingly powerful. It's powerful. It's called LumaFusion, and um, I also have a new iPad, which is uh, it's a newer iPad Pro than whatever the new one is. And so I'm going to try to do some editing on that while I'm at the show and upload some things. We'll see how it goes, um, but that's the plan currently. So. Uh, but otherwise, uh, you know, Instagram, I, I almost always post stuff to Instagram when I'm at shows. So if you don't um, follow me on Instagram, you can by going to at Tabletop Minions. Pretty sure it's just at Tabletop Minions on the Instagrams. <clears throat> Legionnaire says, I'm going to have to change jobs to ever get to Gen Con. My boss always schedules too much work this time of year to go, never mind having enough, enough staff. Yeah, I had that thing too with um, back when there was the... Uh, games Workshop uh, Games Day or whatever, the, you know, that Games Day thing. Um, it was in Chicago for a number of years, and most of my friends would go, and I couldn't go because my job at the time, we had this huge, crazy hootenanny that would happen. It was a week-long, huge convention, and it was always the same time, so I could, I could never go. Um, and then once, eventually, they stopped doing uh, Games Day, sadly, and then now I don't work there anymore, so... Um, I don't know, maybe they'll bring it back again, I'm not sure. That would be nice. Uh, Chuck and Deb Taylor says, in the spirit of Yo from Yokohama, uh, Shalom from Salem, Oregon. Well, appreciate it, thank you very much, that's, that's, it. that's nice. Oh, you know, speaking of shirts, this just reminded me. Uh, so I was, I'm wearing this shirt, because I, I like to wear shirts. Um, I sell t-shirts which you guys probably know because I put videos or like this picture and this picture at the end of a lot of the videos that I do. I have these fun photos of the uh, Pachow t-shirt. Um, well, right now there is a sale that's put on by the t-shirt manufacturer. I get all the t-shirts printed and produced and shipped and all that stuff through a company called Teespring, which I've been very happy with. And currently they are running, oh, it's, it's right over my face, isn't it? Um, uh, currently, they're running an offer. Uh, if you use this, the code SUNSHINE until t uh, uh, until basically the end of the day today, Pacific time, which it's like two more hours ahead of where I am. Anyway, um, you get 10% off, uh, and it's it's not it, it, it's it's a deal that they're putting out there, and they emailed everybody who does well, at least a lot of people who do stuff through Teespring. Hey, how's it going? And, um, and so, yeah, you could use this offer, Sunshine, over here, uh, if you want to, and get 10% off uh, shirts, and, well, I always sell shirts currently, but shirts, uh, until midnight tonight, uh, Pacific time. So if you're interested in that kind of thing, you can go down here to bit.ly, uh, bit.ly slash merchbunker, and get shirts that look like this and other stuff as well. So, anyway, that's me remembering to do that before I forget, and there, now we're done. Anyway. Tim Roy says, Yo, Uncle Adam. Hi from Australia. I just discovered you and recently got back into the hobby. Your, con your content on Kill Team has been great for me. Thank you. Thumbs up. Uh, thank you for watching. I appreciate it. Um, JP Got Rocket says, Not doing Gen Con this year. Missed Origins. I was well satisfied with Adepticon, which may be my one big con a year. 
Um, yeah, I mean, honestly, if it wasn't for the YouTube channel and kind of the business aspect of that and also Game 4 and things like that, um, I would probably not go to as many conventions, obviously. Like, if I didn't have the channel at all, I would I would only be going to Adepticon. You know what I mean? Um, I mean, maybe there's some small local conventions, like Fire and Ice in Manitowoc, Wisconsin. That's like an hour drive away. It's, you know, fun. Um, it's small. It's like 500 people. But, um, but yeah, if I didn't do this stuff at all, I would be going to Adepticon anyway, because it's not that far away. Like, Chicago area for me is about three hours. And it's it's specifically about the miniature thing that I you know that I'm into obviously. Um, Gen Con is pretty humongous. It is a lot more about board gaming and RPGs than it is about miniatures. But it's still you know it's it's a great convention, but it is um, it's massive and it's a lot and it's not cheap. So there's that too. I get that. Six Gunner eighty six says, "I was wondering with my friends what makes our hobby communities and social media so friendly and encouraging compared to many other hobby groups, sports, pets, etc." I mean, you know, the only other hobby groups that I can think of that get a little contentious that I've seen, really, I would say video games get like that sometimes. I mean, I've never been in a like a situation where I'm looking at like a bunch of, you know, cat videos or something like that and then someone starts talking about how this type of cat is junk and this is the best type of cat or you know what I mean like I don't see that stuff too much um yeah I don't know that's I, I guess I haven't come across a ton of it I mean to be fair you do come across it in war I mean, you do come across people being nasty and whatever but that's life to some degree I think so yeah I don't know um hmm Let's see. Wubda Wub Wub says, none of it ever sparked my interest. I guess I'm a spacefarer more than a magic wielder. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I generally am more into sci-fi than fantasy, but I do enjoy Age of Sigmar and um, Frostgrave and Song of Blades and Heroes. Um, so I do like some fantasy stuff. Uh, it, it, it depends. Hey, Christopher Dick, how you doing? Um, Brian Schmidt says, Pretty stoked for war crime, getting my hobby nook prepped today for all the painting in my near future. And there will be a lot of it. If you buy the big box, that's a ton of stuff. Um, yeah, absolutely. It's, uh... The terrain is spectacular. It's really good. The terrain is really, really good. Um, the models that come in that box, the iron golems and the untamed beasts... Those are also really good models. I know that some people of the six like chaos style bands that they've showed so far, there are people who are like, "Oh, I would like these guys best. I like those guys best." Um, I'm I feel lucky to find that like my two probably most favorite uh, war bands are the ones that come in the starter box. Just the, the visual style. Like there's some of the other visual styles I look at and I go, ah, "It's not for me." Um, I mean, they're well done, don't get me wrong, but they're just not necessarily for me. So I'm, I'm glad for that, that the, these are the you know, guys that I like the look of. So um, Let's see here. Brian says, hello from Frederick, Maryland. It's nice to finally have my weekend work schedule back in sync with your shows. Yeah, and hopefully the, well, the shows will stay in sync for a bit longer. Um, luckily, I didn't have to move into everything around, anything around for Gen Con because um, I'll be doing a video this week and then there'll be none next week. But I'll be in Indianapolis and doing Gen Con, and then the week after it'll be the week after I get back. So we won't have to mess up the schedule at all. Um, but we we might by the time Nova Open comes around at the end of August. I have to double check and see what the schedule looks like. So there might be a a wiggle again, and it's it's hard. It, it's very difficult to plan this stuff, kind of you know, and like with travel. You know what I mean? Like the Friday videos. I, I'm very adamant about making the Friday videos happen every Friday, but I can also shoot them potentially weeks in in advance if necessary because I know travel's coming or whatever. But with the live shows, because I have to be live and I've tried doing it on the road before and it has stunk the place up every single time I've tried it, um, yeah, that's been uh, 
that's been kind of difficult. So uh, that's unfortunately why sometimes the schedule of the every other Sunday show changes to be the uh, every Sunday show for a week, and then the every three, two, it's a long story. But yeah, definitely. Um, let's see here, what else have we got? Let's see, Adron says, have my copy of Warcry, Warcry ordered, not sure which models I will keep, but got it for the rules and the scenery more than anything. Yeah, I, like I said, that scenery is amazing. I just, I, I'm really looking forward, like, that will easily be, once I get either a break in Star Wars stuff or get finished with Star Wars stuff, that will probably be the first of the Warcry stuff, the terrain will be the first thing I attack. Um, because I can use it in so many other games, frankly. Um, but yeah, definitely. Uh, Hollenweger says, I'm curious, have you ever played Battletech before? Catalyst Games have recently launched a Kickstarter to revamp their micro-age and it is going rather well. Uh, yeah, actually, Battletech was my first war game, like in middle school, um, back before they really had miniatures and just used little cardboard standees. Um, uh, yeah, I, I have played it, and... Um, it's a ton of paperwork. It's these days, like in comparison to a lot of other games that I enjoy playing, that game is far less hobby and far more spreadsheet a little bit. At least it feels to me. This is personal preference. Um, so yeah, and, and I, I did see that the Kickstarter is doing super well, and I really hope everything goes well for for Catalyst. I was interested in uh, Alpha Strike. Is what their kind of sort of streamlined rules. Uh, were called, and then they finally came out with the book, finally, at it, actually at Origins this year, but then they didn't really have much in the way of models, and they were like, well, we're going to be doing a Kickstarter for models later on, and I'd, so I'd, maybe next year I'll, I'll take a look at it again, but right now I, uh, I, I'm not, uh, that's not my plan, so. <clears throat> Dominic says, Uncle Adam, your voice is smooth as silk, could you do an ASMR video? Well, I don't have one of those weird microphones with the ears on it, so I'm not sure if I could. Um, I don't know that I, yeah, I, I've, I know what you're talking about. Like I've seen bits and pieces of ASMR videos. I don't, I think I would end up laughing or most likely sneezing and that no one needs that like right in their ear with headphones on. Um, so yeah, that's the, it, I don't, I don't, I don't see myself going that direction. Plus those things have a tendency to sometimes make people sleepy, I think. And if you're sitting there trying to paint while you're also getting the ASMR and then you fall asleep and then you poke yourself in the eye with a brush. You don't need that. No one needs that. Um, Wubba Wubba Dub, which I can never get right. Um, did you start painting to beyond tabletop standard with your first minis? I mean, now you're probably aiming higher, but to begin with. Um, no, like honestly, when I first started painting the very first Battletech miniatures that I ever did, I was using uh, enamels, like, like, because I used to paint um, model cars and planes, and testers used to make those, and they still do, I think, those little squarish kind of glass bottles, and you had to thin it with like, I don't know, turpentine or some, I don't know what the heck it was, some sort of thinner. Um, it's not water-based, it's enamels. And so... I was like, I still had a bunch of those sitting around, so I see, I got these now, you know, little robot uh, Battletech dudes. So I started painting with those, and that was not great. That's not what you should be doing. So um, I would not say that my first paint jobs were, were even aiming towards better than tabletop. I, I think a lot of people do that. I think a lot of people will believe that, hey, this is my first... It's part of having so much access to so much information. I'm all for access to information, don't get me wrong, but I think a lot of people when they start, because there's so much that they can learn now with the internet so easily, they go, well, my first models have to knock it out of the park, they have to be amazing, they have to, you know, but, like, if you decided, oh, I'm going to learn how to play guitar, cool, okay, well, now, my very first thing that I do is going to have to be a masterpiece of guitar virtuoso-ness, or whatever, and that's, you have to understand that you're going to have to play, you know, Mary has a little lamb or whatever and get through that stuff and then go through the next stuff. So if, if you're just starting out in models, learning how to prime properly, um, cut a bunch of corners, uh, get things done quick, I think is a smart thing because it can help you get models done and the more models you do, that will just automatically, you learn more by doing than by learning. 
you still need to learn. But it's a, well, I did a video a long time about it, you know, you, you know, spend 10% of your time learning, watching YouTube videos, reading blogs, that kind of stuff, and then spend 90% of your time actually doing, sitting down and actually painting. And that will teach you far quicker than a whole bunch of YouTube videos, um, says the guy who does YouTube videos. But still, it's true, um, definitely. Martin says, Battletech is a deep dive game. You gotta love the super detailed rules or it won't be for you. That's very true. And it's not that I don't, I mean, I did at the time, um, when I was a young, when I was a kid, but now I just, I want games to get done quicker and, and move a little quicker. I don't know. I mean, people talk about, oh, well, we've got shorter attention spans than we used to, but I don't think that's necessarily true. There's still plenty of people who play Battletech, obviously. You see people at, like, conventions that are playing these big, huge games and are there for a long time. I just, as a person who's, who likes to paint more than play, but I still enjoy doing both, you know, if I have, it just, like, like the, the issue for me with Battletech is that there's not a lot of terrain you can do. I mean, I've seen people try to do stuff, but because it's a hex-based game generally, I, I you see people play on flat stuff a lot. You know what I mean? And you see people play with, I mean, and they're military vehicles, basically, these, these mechs. So you can't get super fancy with them. You can, but then it looks a little weird, sort of. You know what I mean? Like, they should be kind of military. I'm not saying they have to be olive drab. Obviously, the different clans will have different clan colors and all that kind of stuff. You know, you're not trying to necessarily camouflage a thing that's 35 meters high or whatever. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. It's just, um, it's not exactly for me anymore. Um, I get, honestly, I get that itch scratched now with the Battletech video game. Not the Mech Warrior video game where you're in the mech and it's all cockpit, but the one from uh, Harebrain Schemes that's turn-based and kind of not quite top-down, but it's like three-dimensional. But yeah, that's that one, that's kind of, that fixes my, my itch for, for Battletech now, for giant robots. Uh, Andreas says, almost tempted to get Warcry for the train. Would make it for a decent start for a Frostgrave table. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, Never thought I'd say that about a GW product again. Yeah, no, definitely. It would be super awesome for Frostgrave. Um, you also mentioned Foreground, or I might just get Foreground. I had heard recently that they're going out of business, Foreground. Uh, someplace, I think it was on Beasts of War, I remember seeing something about how they're not, like, they're closing down. I don't know if that's true. Um, Mike Warner asks, is Warcry going to kill or replace Underworlds? No, they're totally different games. Um, Underworlds is a much more, it's a much quicker and a much more competitive, I feel, um, kind of gateway game. It's a little bit more of a board game hybrid. You play it on a hex board. Um, you have these tiny little war bands, as few as three, as many as maybe seven or eight. Um, and there's no real customization, like your war band is your war band. In Warcry, you can kind of pick and choose and build things a little bit, um, but in, 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 yeah, in Shadespire, Nightfall, all the new ones and stuff like that, you buy a warband and boom, that's it. Those are the guys. And so, um, and it's a lot more card focused as far as combos and things like that. It's got lots of, a lot of stuff going on with that. So in that situation, no, I don't think that, I mean, the thing is, is that Games Workshop these days seems to be coming out with a lot of different games and people, some people are like, well, there's just so many games now. Yeah, but they're not, you don't have to play them all. That's the trick. You know what I mean? They're putting out a wide net to bring people into the hobby. So they've got stuff, you know, that starts at like Shadespire, which is basically aimed towards board gamers and frankly, Magic players and X-Wing players to some degree. Like at my local shop, there's a lot of Magic players who are also now playing Shadespire because they like the strategic aspect of it. It's you know, it goes quick, it's got cards, and they can do deck building, and they love that kind of stuff, and so it works out real well. And some of them try to paint, many of them don't. Some of them go to local commission painters in the area and say, hey, can you paint my, you know, skeleton dudes here? And they're like, sure. Uh, and so, you know, you, you've got some, you know, commerce going on there, which is a lot of fun. Um, Warcry is a little bit more like Kill Team, but it's also not the same. It's not just a one-to-one, -one, well, this is fantasy kill team. It's, it's a different thing, which is also interesting, too, because it's, you know, Age of Sigmar is not just fantasy Warhammer 40,000. Um, they are games that are similar, but some people will tell you that Age of Sigmar has got a slightly easier to understand rule set, and I think that 
Warcry is kind of the same in comparison to Kill Team. It's got kind of slightly easier to understand. It's a simpler rule set than Kill Team. Um, so you've got another kind of entry point. Like Games Workshop these days, smartly so, in my opinion, is all about entry points. Um, if you go back five years, they were all about basically only making really two games and both of them were really hard to get into. You know what I mean? Like you had 40K and you had, you know, Fantasy and both of them was a big investment of money and time to even get started in those things. And now there's tons of different ways for you to really get started, which is great. So, uh, Heath asks, would Warcry be a good starting point for folks who are interested in playing Age of Sigmar? I think it can, it can be, yeah. I mean, the, the trick is, is that the rules are not really particularly compatible. Um, and that's what's interesting to me to some degree. Like in 40k and Kill Team, if you start out playing Kill Team, let's say, and then you want to start moving into 40k down the road, a lot of these things are going to make sense. A lot of the numbers are going to make sense. You have this stat line that is going to be weapon skill, or move, weapon skill, ballistic skill, strength, toughness, um, attacks, wounds, leadership, blah, blah. And you have some of that as well in Age of Sigmar. You've got the circle that's got number of wounds and how far you move and your bravery and all that kind of jazz. And then you've got your weapon stats over here. And in Warcry, it's a very much simpler card and does not does not track particularly to, you know, if you look at Warcry versus an Age of Sigmar stat, they don't make, there's not the same thing going on. So it's not exactly the same. Now, that being said, from what I understand, the models that, that are designed for Warcry, they're going to make War Scrolls for so you can bring those guys into um, Age of Sigmar. They already do that for um, Warhammer Underworlds. Warhammer Underworlds is... Like, you can take those those warbands and play Warhammer Underworld, Shadespire, or whatever you want to do. And then they also have a War Scroll, so you can take that group as a unit and throw it into your Age of Sigmar army. So it's a good, again, starting point if you want, do want to go that direction. But understand that Warcry, the rule set is different than Age of Sigmar. Much more so than the rule set is different between Kill Team and uh, 8th Edition 40k. So, there we go. Um, let me see. I wonder if we'll see rules to use the Warhammer Underworld's warbands in Warcry. That's a good question. Uh, I don't feel like they would. They no, maybe no. because some of the warbands are very small in in Underworlds. Some of them are, you know, like literally three, four maybe models, and, and sometimes the Warcry warbands need to be a little bigger than that. So, yeah, I don't know. Like, they might, but I, I don't I don't know how they... Maybe not, you know what I mean? Like, you can do it where you can take uh, war, uh, Underworld's models and put them into Age of Sigmar because you're just grabbing them as a unit. They just make a single squad, a unit, whatever, and then they're just part, another unit that, in all the units that are in your army. So you can do that. Um, Uh, Raphael says, Underworlds is, is a card game first and a war game second. Warcry is very much a war game with a few abilities on cards. Yeah, that's that's very true. Uh, David Peel says, ASMR makes me violently angry. Oh, well, let's not do that then. I, uh, good thing I didn't buy that microphone with the ears on it. Um, Brian Schmidt says, I think a lot of folks are going to proxy some Underworlds models in for Warcry. For example, Sepulchral Skellies for Na uh, Legion of Nagash Skellies. Nation of Nagash. That's what this should be called instead of Legion. Well, anyway, it's got some alliteration there. Um, yeah, I could see that. I mean, there's no reason not to proxy some of that stuff. I could definitely see that. Although, you, well, no. Legion of Nagash, yeah, because it's mostly skeletons. If I was going to go death for Warcry, I would probably end up doing Spooky Boys, um, you know, the, because I like, I like those models a lot so much. But yeah. Um, what else have we got? Andrew says, hey, long time lurker, I've got a video to edit. Would you discuss which video editing software you recommend? Thanks, pachow. Uh, gosh, well, I mean, if you're gonna be on a PC, like I still, for the most part, generally use Vegas Pro. When I first started doing videos, I edited with a program called, and this is back when Sony used to own it, it was called Sony Vegas Movie Studio. I think that's right. 
and it was the slightly cheaper version of the software, uh, maybe around 100 bucks, roughly American. And uh, I used that for years, and then I decided, well, I want to start trying to get into Adobe Premiere Pro because it's industry standard and stuff. And I did some computer-based uh, training with it, and I had a friend of mine who's an editor, like a pro editor, like I paid him to teach me classes, and then after the four classes that we did, I decided to upgrade to Vegas Pro and not use Premiere, because I still hate it. It's just, it's, I don't like it. It's just not for me. I don't know why. It just, it's very confusing, and I just don't like it, so I use Vegas Pro currently. Um, but I am starting to do more stuff as well, both at work and a little bit, not so much for the channel yet, but I am working on something for the channel with this other piece of software called DaVinci Resolve. And DaVinci Resolve is made by Blackmagic. Blackmagic makes um, cameras and they make uh, a lot of other stuff. Um, a lot of streaming software and things like that, but they make real high-end um, kind of cameras as well. And then um, what I'm using now on the iPad is this program called LumaFusion, which is L-U-M-A Fusion. Um, made by a company called LumaTouch, which, you know, there you go. And um, it's like, 30 bucks, I think, and it works really, really nicely. I mean, it's not the most powerful thing you'll find out there, but it is astoundingly powerful for something that literally I can run on my phone, to be honest with you. Um, so, you know, it depends if you've got an iPad or not, but still, yeah, it's it's a decent piece of uh, software as well. So yeah, honestly, just finding a piece of software that you are comfortable with, like I said, um, you know, Premiere is still kind of industry standard, but I generally kind of stay away from it because I don't like the way it works. Um, and I get it, I can get Premiere pretty cheap um, because my lovely wife works at the university. So, um, you know, it's not even a cost thing, although Premiere is also astoundingly expensive. It's like $600 a year or something like that. So, yeah, it's a subscription service. So, yeah, there's other things out there. Don't just, you know, watch a bunch of YouTube videos and go, well, I got to use Premiere, you know, if, especially if you're just starting out. Yeah. Let's see. Um, let me see here. Brinty says, I just wish the Warcry Age of Sigmar stuff allowed me to take Molag, Molag, in the Gloomspire band, but nope, Molag is the cutest. Well, I mean, I, I suspect that down the road they will maybe make expansions. I, there's this, this kind of talk has been going around a little bit lately, too, and I've been noticing it. Um, people are talking about, well, so... How closely is Warcry going to follow um, Kill Team? Like, is there going to be an Elites style book that comes out? Is there going to be a Commander style book? I mean, they'll call it other stuff. Um, that may be the case. You may find some expansion that comes later that adds in Skaven, because they've been kind of ignored. Um, Seraphon, um, I think Sylvaneth were ignored. Dwarves, you know, all that stuff. So. When you look at the four different, um, whatever they are called, I forget what they're called now, um, the alliances, the four different alliances, you've got Chaos, Order, Destruction, and Death. Chaos is already covered by all the, the new models that they've made, and you don't, you can't bring in your Nurgle stuff, you can't bring in your current, you know, whatever, you, you just use these warbands that they've produced, but if you want to do order, then you've got a couple different warbands, like three different warbands you can bring in. Um, Deepkin, um, Daughters of Cain, I think. I should look it up. Well, it's on the website, actually. But yeah, um, and also, oh, and Stormcast, obviously. And then you've got like a couple different orc groups that you can bring in for destruction. You've got some, like I said, spooky boys and skeletons and and Flesh Eater Courts and stuff like that for death. Um, but there are some groups that I've heard plenty of complaints about people saying, well, what about Skaven? Well, what about, you know, Lizardmen? What about, you know? So maybe they'll have some of that stuff drop in um, in the future. We'll see how that goes. Uh, Darren says, greetings from a Northern Virginia grocery store. Keep up the excellent work. Well, thanks. I appreciate you hanging out at the, um, at the, uh, the grocery store there. Uh, Kathy Wapple says, my husband loves Vegas for editing. Hey, Kathy, how you doing? Um, yeah, I like Vegas a lot, too. I think it's great. The city, not so much. 
but the software I like quite a bit. Snowflight says that GW should re-sculpt all of their skellies to look like the Shadespire Warband skellies. Yeah, those are awesome. Those are amazing skeletons, and I do wish that they would redo their skeleton line, because, yeah, right now it's pretty old. Um, so, definitely. Let's see here. I just saw Claudio asks, what's your personal feeling about the 3D printed figures against classic part building concept? Already mentioned, just tuned in. I guess I'm not sure what you mean. Uh, 3D printed figures against classic part building. Oh, are you talking about like the way that they kind of fit together? Like the 3D, 3D designed models that fit together like only just one way? Um, so yeah, it, a lot of models that you see that are new, especially from Games Workshop, things like that, they, they're very dynamically posed and they look awesome, but they kind of only go together that one way. They've been designed so they sort of snap together or whatever, and they are in a really amazing, cool, dynamic pose, but you can't pose them in some other cool, dynamic pose or even a slightly more static pose. Like, they go together one way and that's it. Whereas if you look at, like, your regular Space Marines, they're not usually super dynamically posed when you buy a normal kit of, like, ten of them because they are designed to be a fighting unit, so they're not doing all kinds of crazy dance moves. They're basically just like, I'm holding a gun and shooting. But maybe you could customize them a little bit, maybe turn this guy's waist so he's shooting over here, or this guy's shooting over here, but he's looking over there. And so you can you can kind of customize just because the parts are modular, um, but then they all still aren't doing anything super cool, whereas like those one-off models, you know, like the Apothecary, the, the Primaris Apothecary is like standing like one foot like on a down soldier and he's holding this thing and all this stuff. He's got his gun and whatever, but you can't make him look like he's doing something else. He kind of goes together just that one way. I don't particularly have a problem with that as much, um, but I think if it keeps going to the point where every model is like that, like if all of a sudden your normal Space Marines, your normal bog standard whatever type of troops, if they are all super dynamically posed, then that can become a little troublesome. Um, weird miniatures, the folks that make Malifaux, they make all of their stuff super dynamically posed, crazy, you know, amazing looking sculpts, but those are, that's also a skirmish game, and it's also, they're all specific characters. This is not usually trooper number four in my group of ten, this is this person who other people who play Malifaux are like, oh yeah, I know what that person looks like because the, I've seen this model on other people. So it's not weird when you bring it, if you were to bring out that same model but completely posed in a different way, people would be like, I don't know who that is. And you'd be like, well, because I, I took off the hat and I changed this and I changed that and I changed that, but it's so-and-so. And you'd be like, oh, okay, I'm going to take your word for it. But they wouldn't know that without, you know, they're much more, I, I, I don't want to say iconic, but they're more... They're more dialed in, and they're like, this is what this model looks like, and everybody who does it, that model looks the same. And that's fine, but there's just the one model. There's just that one personality. Whereas when you're dealing with Eldar, you're dealing with orcs, you're dealing... You want to be able to kind of at least change up, like, he's holding the gun up, holding the gun down, twisting this way, you know, whatever, that kind of stuff. You still can't do a ton of work. You can't, like, not every little joint on every little like legs you look at a space marine their legs are all basically you know you get five poses and that's pretty much about it for legs so you can kind of mix and match and that's great but i don't know i don't have a big problem with it um but i think if it goes to the point where that's like the entire way that normal troops are done is in these crazy dynamic poses then when you have three squads of them like my my space or uh, stormtroopers right now the stormtroopers you can't really modify them very easily so I've got four squads of stormtroopers, and they all, they're not all posed the same within the squad, but there's seven guys in this squad, seven guys in this squad, seven guys in this squad, and they're all the same pose across the squads. So you want to probably mix them up on the table a little bit so they don't all look like they're, you know, uh, twinsies or whatever. Anyway. Uh, what is your first personal feeling? Oh, I just answered that. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, morning from LA. Gonna try and finish up Magnus today. That's a that's a fun model. That's a big one. Uh, what else have we got? Randall asks, "What have I missed?" Well, you know, we talked about um, stuff. 
and, and things. Uh, level 6 says, Daughters of Cain models look pretty neat, but I hear that they're on a hard end of painting and rather pricey for a full Age of Sigmar army. Well, I mean, they've got big wings a lot. Not all of them, but there are some big winged models in there, and some people have a hard time painting, like, really nice smooth transition, like, big, like, you know, wings, you know? Like, not like bird wings, but like bat wings type of thing, or, you know, whatever. Um, some of them are big snakes. Snakes can be easy to paint with an airbrush, but can be hard to paint with a, you know, paintbrush sometimes. Um, yeah, that kind of stuff. Uh, Grimlock Steve says, I'd like to get into Malifaux, but I find it very hard to know what to start with. They are, I swear to God, they are actually with, with now with a new launch of third edition, or th third, I think they call it third edition. It's not Mark III. No, that was, that's War Machine. I think it's third edition is what they're calling it. Uh, third edition Malifaux is coming out or is out. I'm not sure. Um, it's either just about out or it's out. And it is, uh, I, but they are, I believe, releasing some starter boxes. So uh, I, I've seen some pictures and stuff like that. I'll probably know more after Gen Con because they always have a big booth at Gen Con. So, um, yeah, but I believe that they are doing that because, yeah, it was kind of difficult because you just were like, I need the book. And then they just release all of these crews. Well, do I just need a crew? Or do I need more than a crew? Or, you know, like, do I need a crew plus some, some other folks? Or I don't, yeah. And I'm sure that there were probably YouTube videos or blog posts or something out there, someplace where you could find that says, well, this is a good way to start and everything like that. But I think that hopefully they've taken some cues, honestly, from Games Workshop. And, and I think a lot of companies need to do this and start understanding that there are people out there who don't already understand your story. Like that's a big thing in marketing is understanding that not everyone thinks the way that you do. So when you come across a website for anything, any kind of hobby, any kind of whatever, and it's a lot of jargon and it's a lot of like, I assume you already understand how to do this, that can be pretty gatekeepery and can really keep new people out of that hobby. But when you pick it, when you, when you make something like if you're a company and you're making, let's say you're getting into fishing. Well, if you go to some fishing manufacturer, some company that makes rods or reels or whatever, and they don't explain like what you need to know as a beginner to make an informed choice, you will instead have analysis paralysis and not make any choice. And then you won't buy their product. But if I explain to you, all right, well, if you're starting out and you want to fish off of a bridge and use a spinner thingy, what I, you know, I don't know a ton about fishing. I used to, my dad and I used to fish a long time ago, but not so much. Anyway, um, explaining that stuff versus just saying, well, this has got torque that does this, and this has got... Mm. Uh, explaining yourself to the newer people who come in there, you forget that not everybody understands the things that you're talking about. You know what I mean? So explaining these things to newbies, for lack of a better term, helps your hobby thing sell better because then they go, oh, okay, cool, that is, that is what I'm looking for. That's where I want to start. And I think it's just a smart idea. <sighs> um, Patrick says, I miss Mordheim so much, still looking for a replacement torn between Frostgrave, Age of Sigmar Skirmish, Kings of War Vanguard, and now Aeros Warcry. Um, if you really like Mordheim, and I don't know a ton about Kings of War Vanguard, I'm hoping actually this year at Gen Con to get at the very least a demo of uh, uh, Vanguard for Kings of War because I would like to learn more about it, just to be able to answer questions like these. But if you like um, Mordheim, then you should play Frostgrave, straight up. Uh, Frostgrave reminds me so much of War, uh, or of Mordheim. It's just, it's, you know, Mordheim, you were groups of treasure hunters going into the ruined city that had been hit by a comet to find bits of this stone and you're fighting against the other warbands, but you really are just trying to get out of there with a bunch of stuff, and that's great. Frostgrave is a city that was frozen for a thousand years due to a magic spell that went all pear-shaped, and now it's thawed, and you are a group of treasure hunters fighting against other treasure hunters trying to get in there and find cool magical items and money and crap like that and get out. And so, yeah, it's the big benefit, in my opinion, of actually of Frostgrave over Mordheim is that it still has the leveling up kind of thing going on, but it's mainly just your 
um, your wizard and your apprentice who do the leveling for the most part. It's really just your wizard. Your apprentice just sort of rides the coattails. But all of the um, henchmen, hench people, they, um, they are not d tied to the specific um, faction. So like in, in Mordheim, you'd have Reichlanders, and then there would be a boss for the Reichlander, like an HQ style unit, and there was a bunch of Reichlander, um, you know, hench people. Well, if you decided now I want to change to a different warband, a different or a different faction, you had to change everybody. With Frostgrave, hench people are basically all generic, and you just are swapping out the wizard and the apprentice. And so maybe you go with elementalists, and you know whatever and then you decide no well, no I want to switch over to necromancers so you just swap out the wizard and the apprentice and but you know a thug is still a thug a templar is still a templar um a guy with the crossbow is still a guy with the crossbow so it doesn't matter um and that's I think that gives a lot of benefit for being able to kind of hop around a little bit it also gives a benefit for making the game a little bit more balanced the one issue that like when we used to play a, a bit of Mordheim it was frequently, okay, let's get together to play Mordheim. Nobody build this warband. Because these guys are, are overpowered. And like nobody, you know, and it was just like a lot of like having to kind of negotiate early on. Like, let's not do this and let's not do that because this is broken and this is screwed up. And I don't see that as much with Frostgrave because the pool of henchmen is basically the same for everybody. So there's not anybody who's going like, well, I'm going to take these guys because they've got the amazing henchmen. The henchmen are all the same. So um, I think that's a big benefit too. So there you go. Frostgrave. Um, Paul says, I enjoy fishing apart from the catching the fish part. I just like the sitting down. Yeah, that, that's pretty good. Uh, Mike G says, the Malifaux second edition starter box was horrible. Uh, overly complicated models and minis you would never use other than in the starter box missions. It, weird miniatures, like their minis, are incredibly designed, incredibly dynamically posed and, 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 and really great, but they are difficult to build in some situations. Not in all of them, but there are many of those models that are, like they've gone as far as to make a t-shirt that they sell. There's this character named Jan, Jan Lowe, something like that. And they actually now like at the booth at, the, at Gen Con, they make a t-shirt that says, I survived building Jan Lowe. Cause like, He's got like a little tiny beard, like not like a big beard like mine, but like a little almost goatee, which is a separate piece on his face, which is that big. So, yeah. Um, so if you're if it's if it's your first game, Malifaux might be hard for you to build, uh, but it's you know it, they, the models if you get them done look amazing, just straight up amazing. Um. Let's see here. Paul says, I'm gonna pick up a four by four piece of wood this week so I can build a Gaslands board. Um, I got the new Gaslands book in the mail uh, last week, two weeks ago, from Osprey. It's called Gaslands Reloaded and it's a hard cover and it's thicker. It's got all the, the additional stuff that they came out with after the initial launch of Gaslands. That's all in there, plus a bunch of other new stuff and everything like that, and it's amazing looking. It's just a, it's a gorgeous book and I'm really super uh, excited about that, so that's really cool. I think that book comes out in September, I think. I've gotten two really interesting things from Osprey recently. I got that book, and then I also got a game called Reality's Edge, which is a cyberpunk skirmish game, and it's produced by, it's written by the guy who did, um, This Is Not a Test, which is a uh, post-apocalyptic, basically it's a fallout skirmish game without having the fallout license it's very much like fallout um but now he's doing a cyberpunk one for osprey actually instead of instead of self-publishing and doing a kickstarter and all that stuff and it's yeah that one's coming out i think in august or is that one coming out in september they're both coming out soon so let's see spanky bat says i survived lan yo yan lo's beard there you go Yan Lo, that's, that's what the name is. I couldn't remember it, right? Yeah. Randall says, Malifaux is very fiddly, but great minis, but, it, but it's a challenge. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Snowfight says, can you imagine if Malifaux had a full-scale army game and having to assemble 50-plus Malifaux models? Hobby nightmare. Well, they do have an, uh, uh, 
an army game. It's called The Other Side. The thing that's interesting about The Other Side is that the models are already pre-assembled. So it's funny because when they had to pre-assemble the models for The Other Side, they're not necessarily as dynamically posed and sculpted. You know what I mean? Like they're, they're not bad. They're not bad, but they're not nearly as crazy as the ones that they expect you to build which is understandable because they're having to crank them all ahead of time and, you know, in mass quantities or whatever. Um, but yeah, so that's, uh, that's actually not a, uh, it, some of the models, depending on the, on the, like the, there's like a fishman kind of, uh, faction. And some of those are really cool sculpts, but on the other hand, the plastic is also a little bit softer. So some of them are kind of bendy in the box. Um, I got into the other side actually at Adepticon, but sadly I have not painted any of it yet because like, they've got some really awesome, like, huge models, too. Like, they've got a huge, like, fishman guy. They've got a huge robot. And, uh, but when I opened up the boxes, like, there's huge gaps, too. Um, and I think the robot, one of his legs came off. So I have to glue that back on. So they're built. You just have to glue them to the base. Except that sometimes some of them are not built in that their parts have fallen apart. Or some of them are built, but then there's huge gaps that you have to fill in, which is a bit of a bummer. Um, yeah. Um, let's see here. What else? New Gaslands. Uh, quick question. Is the new book's layout better than the first by chance? Um, I mean, visually, yes. Definitely. Uh, as far as, like, where rules are, I don't know about that. I guess I haven't looked that deep into it to know... Because I know there was some issues with the original book where you were like, well, where's the rule for this again? And it would be, like, in a slightly odd sp spot. Uh, visually, it's amazing looking in comparison, but uh, I don't know about actual, like, this rule should be near this thing because it makes sense kind of thing. That I haven't looked super close at, unfortunately, so. But it does look a lot nice, nicer. <clears throat> Let's see here, people talking about Malifaux, that's cool. Um, Jonathan Stevens says, first time finally catching the stream live. Your videos have helped out my hobbying tons. Great stuff. Well, thanks, I appreciate it. Uh, B Bigger says, Reality's Edge is August release, according to Amazon. Nice. Okay, yeah, so that's that one's the one that's coming out in August, and then Gaslands Reloaded is the one I think is coming out in September. Um, or Refueled. So Gaslands something or other. Uh, yeah. Uh, Comptroller, I haven't, says, I haven't been to the game room in a bit, and I stopped by Old School now, and then I do... Uh, I go to Dragon's Roost uh, every other Friday for a Gloomhaven group. I never got into Gloomhaven. I've got friends who do it, though. Uh, Opus Day says, I started watching the show for paint tips on my board game minis, and I've fallen in love with the orcs. I've never played any Warhammer, but now I'm interested in dipping in. Maybe Warcry is how. I mean, yeah, you know, uh, you could use orcs in Warcry. Uh, you can also, if you're into more sci-fi style orcs, you could you you could do orcs for kill team. Um, you could do orcs for just um, straight up uh, Warhammer Underworld. You know, for uh, there was a great orc band in Shadespire. Um, I did actually a series of videos about those guys about painting that group of four. I think it was um, a while back. A hobby progress vlog, if you will, uh, talking about those guys. I'm trying to think what else I. Yeah, but it depends. If you like fantasy orcs better, then Warcry might be the place to go. Um, but also potentially Shadespire. And uh, if you like sci-fi orcs, then I would take a look at doing orcs and kill team, because they're a lot of fun for that, too. Uh, the Dark Prince's Lanyo is fiddly. Night Model's Harry Potter minis are worse, as their wands are so fragile and badly mixed resin. Mm. Yeah, you know, that's true. I, well, I've never seen any of those models up in, in, like, in person, but it would make sense that them holding a wand at scale, it would be so tiny. Yeah, or they would end up making it really thick, and then it would look weird. That's a good... That's the problem with wands, you know what I mean? They should have been walking around carrying stabs. That would have worked better for modeling. I don't know why people don't think ahead like that, when they made those movies and all that. Um, let's see here. Daniel says, Uncle Adam, I screwed up and bought a lot of minis. Now I am kind of overwhelmed. How do you recommend to finish every project? Build everything first, then paint? It's mostly Kill Team and 40K. Um, 
generally, if I in that situation, here's what I would do. If you've got a, a kill team group around you, and you've got enough stuff to build a kill team in all that stuff that you bought, I would build your kill team, and then paint your kill team, so that you can then play with that kill team. And then, you've, you've basically gotten a win. You may not win in the game, I rarely do, but I'm saying you've completed a task, and now you can take this stuff, which was originally just a bunch of plastic on sprues, and now you actually have pieces that you can play in the game, and then mentally you're like, cool, now I've, I've completed something. And then you can go on to the next one. Um, everyone's mileage may vary, but generally for me, I would not build everything and then try to paint everything. I would break it up into chunks. I would build these guys and then paint them and build these guys and then paint them because it allows me to kind of switch my brain back and forth between build and paint mode. Sometimes I might build two groups and then paint two groups or something like that. Or I might build two or three groups and then paint one and then go build another one. Or just It depends on how your flow kind of works. But deciding I'm going to build everything and then paint everything can set yourself up for a shutdown, basically. You know what I mean? Um, uh, just motivation-wise, you'd just be like, I don't want to paint any more models. I want to do something else. And, and in those situations, great, then go build something. You know what I mean? But if you've already built everything because you spent three months building everything and now it's paint time and that's all you have, well, if your brain doesn't want to paint, then you know, you're sort of stuck and you end up going and doing something else and then you get out of hobby motivation. So chunking it up into bits, I think, works a little bit better. But also looking for places where if I finish these guys, I can now use them to play Kill Team. Or, you know, if I finish these guys, I can add them to this army. And now instead of playing 1500 point games, we can play 1750 games or something like that. You know what I mean? Like looking at being able to finish projects and then actually use them, that's actually kind of important, I think. Unless you're just, I just want to paint because I enjoy painting, then you don't have to worry about getting things done to play. But then you still want to get things done to set up in your, you know, whatever, your case or something like that. You know what I mean? That's just, yeah, it's interesting. Um, but yeah, you can bring it back from the precipice. Wesley says, for me, I just want more factions in Warcry. I'd love to be able to play the Seraphon. Yeah, again, I'm wondering if there's going to be an addition where they're going to add in Skaven, Seraphon, Sylvaneth, other things that start with S. I, I, I don't know. Um, skeletons. No, I already got the skeletons. Um, but yeah, that's a possibility. I, I, at least I feel like that's what they're going to do, something down the roads. Uh, Joshua asks, have they released rules for Necromunda peeps in Kill Team? House Orlock and House Cawdor look super fun to play. They have not that I know of, but I know what you're talking about. They would be, I think, a lot of fun to play. I think that they would probably be, well, I was going to say I would think they would be underpowered in comparison to most things in, in, in Kill Team, but honestly they're probably about as powerful as Guardsmen in some situations if you had to, like, actually write rules for them. So, yeah, I don't know. It's a good question. Um, but, yeah, I haven't seen anything. They're great models. I love the, the Necromunda models, uh, and it would be fun to bring some of those, I think, into Kill Team. That would be a, lot, a hoot. Uh, Sorrow Dusk says, use copper wire for wands. Um, hmm. Well, they don't look like them. They're made out of, like, wood. I mean, you could make them bendy, but they would bend all the time. Like, you'd, like, look at them funny, and they would bend. I would say use copper, or uh, sorry, brass rod, because that's going to be stiffer. It's just going to look like, you know, it's not going to look, I don't know, that's a tough one. Those wands are difficult. They should have given those kids guns. See, that would have been way easier. Yeah. JP Got Rockets says build in squads, paint a squad, do another thing, paint another squad. Yeah, like I said, chunking it up makes a lot more sense, generally, at least is trying to keep your motivation going. Comptroller, does anyone else uh, enjoy using their airbrush but is unmotivated to use it sometimes because of the setup and cleanup of using it over in the ease of a brush? So I like using my airbrush, but I don't like cleaning my airbrush and setting up my airbrush, so I just use a regular brush. Um, what I have a tendency to do, and I think that this is a big deal, I've talked to plenty of people who are like, I'd love to use my airbrush, but it's always clogged. It's always grungy, it takes me forever to clean it, um, the, the best way to fix that problem is to never let it dry out. So when I get done airbrushing something 
and it's now time for me to leave my little airbrush room, which is my little weird Harry Potter uh, room under the stairs in the basement, um, and go do other stuff. I take my airbrush apart, and there's a bunch of parts that you don't have to worry about because they never touch paint. Uh, it, you know, there's the thing that unscrews off the handle, eh, don't worry about that. There's a little nut usually back there you take off, there's the needle, the needle's important, you want to clean off the needle, get it wet, stuff like that. Be very carefully, you know, take a piece of paper towel and clean it this way. You don't want to bend the tip because then you're done. Um, and set it someplace, whatever. Uh, there's a couple other pieces that can come out, the trigger can come out. But then there's the main body of the brush, there's usually the front nozzle and then like this guard that goes around the front nozzle. All three of those parts can have paint in them, in the cup and all that kind of stuff. Those are the parts that I clean, not super crazy, I don't get in there nuts and really, you know, scrub everything out. I put some, you know, before I've taken it all apart, I've put some airbrush cleaner, I use Iowa airbrush cleaner, I squirt that in there, and I spray it out into this little other thing, and then uh, I throw some water in there distilled water, which I guess is important because then you don't have to worry about mineral buildups, but you can get it at the grocery store, I think. You do that and clean it all up. And then I take the, like I said, the main body of the airbrush, those two front nozzle bits, and I put them into an ultrasonic cleaner. You don't have to use an ultrasonic cleaner. I got mine on Amazon, I think it was like 25 bucks. Um, you could also just use a, a, a thing of water, but I put them in there and then that's where my airbrush stays until the next time that I want to paint. The next time I want to paint, I reach in there and I take it out of the fluid. So it sits in water and also some airbrush cleaner that I squirt in there the entire time I'm not using it. So I've never had a clogged brush. I have never had a brush where I'm like, oh, I've got a, like the needle stuck or whatever. If you get done painting and you think you've cleaned everything out and then you just set it there like all still put together, you are asking for trouble. You're asking for problems. If you take it apart and just drop it in there and then go do other stuff and live your life for maybe days or weeks and then come back, it's not going to rust. I mean, unless you got like a $4 airbrush from China, maybe, then it might rust. But anything else, those are made out of brass that's been chromed. You might, like, I'll admit, like, around where the cup, the gravity cup attaches to the body, like, there's not as much nice, nice chrome there anymore. You can see a bit of a line, but you just see the brass underneath it, and it's not that big of a deal. Keeping your brush wet your airbrush wet in between uses means you never have to like get in it and really scrub it and clean it. So that's something to think about. Um, there's a well-known guy on YouTube. He doesn't post as much as he used to anymore on YouTube, but his name is uh, Les Bursley. And he swears by using um, a nail polish remover to clean a brush. So if you've got a brush that's already clogged and stuff like that, you can run nail polish remover through it and it will get rid of pretty much all kinds of um, acrylic paints so that you don't have to worry about that anymore either. But keeping the brush wet, honestly, in between uses means you don't ever have to like really get in there and scrub it and clean it. And, you know, because you, they sell those like little tiny brushes that you can slide in there to like get inside the brush and try to clean out the paint bits and stuff like that. The secret to never having dried paint in your brush is to never let your brush get dry. Just straight up. Um, works out really well. Um, let's see here. Michael Strange says, I always disassemble and dunk the airbrush parts in the green drink when done. Even if I don't paint the following day, I finish cleaning, drying, and, and reassemble. Always ready to go thereafter. Like I said, I just never, I just never, um, dry out my brush. I, you know, when, when, once I actually start painting, then it probably gets dry, but then it's still got stuff in there, so. Um... How much an average airbrush costs? Uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's, I, I bought a, a kit on Amazon and it was included the airbrush and a compressor and the whole deal and all kinds of junk and it was like 90 bucks. And then like the airbrush that I generally use, which is an Iowata Eclipse, it's an HP CS. Uh, I think that just airbrush by itself, when I first bought it, I got like 40% off because it was back when, um, Hobby Lobby used to let you take 40% off any single item that wasn't already on sale. But I think the retail at the time for like 180. So if you look at it that way, like my airbrush costs twice as much as an Amazon entire airbrush kit, including a compressor. So there's a range. Um, but I would say, especially if you're mainly just gonna be using it for priming, varnishing, maybe a little bit of like base coating and maybe a touch of highlighting. Honestly, if you spent 
$100 on an airbrush, if you spent $50 on an airbrush, you'd probably be pretty happy with it in general. If you started getting real fancy um, and wanting to do a lot of different, you know, techniques and changing up needles and nozzles and getting in there and making little details, like you'll hear people who are like, oh, I can paint eyes with an airbrush. Well, I'm never going to do that because I just generally don't paint eyes, but I'm never going to get that detailed and, and crazy. I, I'm not into that with the airbrush. But when you want to get down to the point where you get that kind of detail, then you pay a bunch of money for an airbrush, but still generally not more than maybe 300 bucks max. I don't think I've ever seen an airbrush cost more than maybe 250. Um, but I'm sure there probably are some out there. Maybe they have ones that have diamonds on them or something like that. Bling. <clears throat> Sorrow Dusk says, I got a $1 snipper made in China. I'm assuming like a uh, sprue snipper type of thing. It was fine, but then rusted in three weeks and then broke. Yeah. I had one that I had that I bought at the electronics store actually years ago for like like twenty bucks. It was surprisingly like I really needed a, a new or I needed a snipper because I've been seeing online that that's the best way. I had been using a like a wire cutters like a curved wire cutters for a while, but you're like no, you want the straight one that's a side snipper. And so I bought one. So I just didn't even think to go look for some reason at a hobby store. So I bought one at an electronics store, and it was like twenty bucks. But I used it for years and years and years and years. And then finally it did stop. Like, I don't know what happened, but it did start to seize up. And I couldn't, like, I could squeeze it, but then it didn't want to reopen again. And it was becoming a pain in the rear. So I ended up getting one actually at a hobby store, like, you know, uh, like a game store. And it cost considerably less. I did not buy the fancy schmancy Citadel one. Um, that's if you want to spend like 35 bucks, you can get that. But, you know, I hear good things about it. I guess. I mean, like, it's, it's, it's solid, but I've, I've never used it, I don't think. Um, Rubber City Nomad says, buy a quality airbrush first. You'll regret, regret it later because you get what you pay for with them. Yeah, I mean, that's, that is true. I do think that there's something to be said about, you know, if it, 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 a piece like that that you're going to use over and over again, um, that's sort of solid. Spending a bit more on it if you can is not a bad idea. Um, talking about brushes though, like not airbrushes, but normal paint brushes, I'm a big fan of not using super expensive brushes. And so is Sam, strangely enough. Um, we're gonna make a video probably post Gen Con uh, talking about brushes, like what to look for in brushes. We're not gonna sit there and say, this is the brand of br brush you must buy. Um, instead, we're going to say, this is what you should look for in brushes, and we're going to talk about, like, cause seriously, like, the brushes that Sam does, like, 90% of his painting with costs, I think the brushes cost six bucks for five brushes. Like, they come in a pack, like, at the hobby store. Not even the hobby store, like, at the craft store. Um, yeah, he uses pretty inexpensive brushes. I use sometimes inexpensive brushes. Sometimes I use GW, like, brushes that are, like, four or five years old just because I bought a bunch of them back in the day, and then I just beat them to death to the point where they won't even work as, as dry brushes anymore, and then I go dig around in this drawer until I find a new one that is seriously like five, six years old that's just been sitting there in the, you know, with a little clear tube over the end to protect the bristles, and I'm like, oh, okay, cool. Um, that just seems, to, but I'm also starting to get into the like Hobby Lobby kind of inexpensive brushes too because one of the benefits of those types of brushes, as opposed to say like a brush like from Games Workshop or from Reaper or for that, is that they have they have more belly. So in the brush, let's say that this is the brush here, and this is the metal part. This mid part, kind of where it bows out and it goes back in again, this is known as the belly, I believe, and this is the tip. Uh, the bigger belly that you have on your brush, and sometimes the longer bristles, you know, some brushes don't bow out as much, and come to a tip, some of them are just longer and straighter. The more bristle, the more brush, the more reservoir for paint. So you're not constantly like two strokes and then I have to go get more paint, two strokes and I have to get more paint. You can get paint in your brush, not all the way up to the metal, again, because you don't want to do that particularly if you don't have to. Um, it can shorten the life of your brush. Um, but then you can be painting, 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 and then finally go and get more paint. It just speeds things up. But there's a lot of different things we're going to talk about in that video once we get it done. <clears throat> Randall says, I just destroyed my snipper. Apparently cutting the hard wire isn't recommended. Yeah, no, not necessarily. They're not supposed to do that. 
Um, Nick says, I just got to tune in. Are you going to play Warcry? Ha ha. Um, yeah, that is kind of the subject for today's um, uh, thing here, isn't it? I think I put it up on that thing right there. Um, so I don't necessarily see myself playing it right off the bat. I will definitely be painting up the terrain. That'll be the first thing that I get done with Warcry, like I mentioned. Once I get either a break in Star Wars stuff, <clears throat> excuse me, either a break in Star Wars stuff or get done with Star Wars stuff, then I will do that terrain for sure because it is awesome. It's great terrain, absolutely great. And as someone mentioned earlier, you can you then use it in um, like Frostgrave. You can use it in Age of Sigmar. You can use it in tons of stuff. Anything pretty much fantasy, or even a little post-apocalyptic to some degree. If you want to go that direction, you could do that. Some of that stuff with that. It'd be very cool. So it's great terrain. I'm definitely going to use the terrain. I'm going to definitely work on that stuff. Um, I am actually kind of hoping to get a demo in maybe of Warcry. Like I've been watching some battle reports. You know, Ash Barker did a bunch of battle reports. I've watched some of those. I've read the book, obviously, because um, I got it right here. Um, but it, there's something to be said about actually sitting down and playing the game. And so I'm hoping at, either at Gen Con or at the Nova Open at the end of this month, or actually end of uh, August, uh, I'm hoping to at least get a War, uh, a War Cry demo in. Um, because I don't think I'm going to be working on the models that came in the box super soon. Um, there's a part of me, and I'm, I'm sure that at some point they'll release those models separately, just like they did with Necromunda, where like you could get the Eshers and the Goliaths separately. Um, so I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll try to see, but like I do kind of want to modify some of those Iron Golem uh, models. I want to give them guns and stuff like that and use them in other games. I think that would be a lot of fun. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure. I, I honestly don't know. Like I like the fact that they've gone pretty in depth in the campaign stuff. Like if you go through the book, the campaign section in this book is really long and not like in a bad way. It is from like page 82 to page, good Lord. Um, like 129. So that's like 50 pages, it seems like, I think, of, of just campaign stuff. So there's a very long campaign section in this book. They talk about match play, they talk about narrative, blah, blah, blah. But really, like the campaign section is deep, which is very cool. Because the game system itself is pretty simple. So if you're just playing match play, real simple games with it, for me, that's not necessarily super interesting, but the campaign stuff is what I think would be a little bit more interesting. But I have a suspicion, like I said, just knowing what I know about this, the projects that I've got working on right now, this is not jumping ahead of line. This is not jumping, you know, to the forefront. Like when Kill Team came out, it like production on pretty much everything else in the in the old uh, nerd bunker downstairs stopped, and it was just Kill Team, partially because. Like, they sent me the box for Kill Team nearly a month early so I could get the terrain all painted up and then make videos about it and all that kind of jazz. These guys, uh, with Warcry, I got the box, like, on a Thursday, and the embargo on making videos was two days later on Saturday. So um, there wasn't a ton of time to get stuff, like, painted up and did, like I did with, uh, um, with Kill Team last summer. So that was kind of a bummer as well. But... Generally, like I said, the terrain is definitely on the list. Once I get kind of done with start with the Star Wars stuff that I'm working on, that'll probably be my next big thing. Um, and then, and then we'll see. I mean, maybe th my mind will have changed a little bit. Maybe they'll become a big group of people around here in my local area. That's another thing to take into consideration all the time. Is like, yeah, you might really love the game, but if nobody else is playing it around you, you're going to have a bit of an uphill climb. Now, the benefit with a game like this is because it's skirmish style, it's not that hard to do both war bands, paint them up and all that stuff, and then take everything to the shop and say, look, you want to play? I've got everything we need. And, you know, and then you can do that, and then hopefully you'll maybe convert some people to be like, oh, that's really cool. Maybe they'll buy the book in a war band or whatever. Maybe they'll buy the whole starter box, depending on whether they're still in stock or not. Um, and I think that's important. Um, like when I go to play Kill Team at my local shop, nine times out of ten I bring all my terrain. 
you know, but it's also, it just fits in like one of those Rubbermaid like containers that goes underneath your bed. Not even the super long ones, it's like the half length one. And it fits all in there. And then I have a case that I got my models in. I've got like six Warbands uh, for, for Kill Team in one case because they're small and it's great. So, um, yeah, so that just works out real well. Um, if it was a big, huge battle game like Age of Sigmar or 40k, again, that's harder to build two forces and then just say, hey, would you like to learn how to play? You know, small games are better for that. So, yeah, we'll see how it goes. If people locally start playing it a bunch and things like that, that may also steer my, um, my you know, what my, my plans are for progress. But right now, I'm not saying I'm not going to play it. I'm just saying I don't have any plans to play it real heavy right now. I think it's going to be definitely terrain for sure, and then kind of wait and see. So that's kind of where that's at. But I am super happy that uh, that they put a lot of um, campaign stuff in there because I do like that that stuff. Like right now I'm in a camp where, I don't know, I was going to say I was in the middle of a campaign right now for Kill Team. I have no idea whether we're in the middle of it or not. We may just have started. We're four games in. Um, but it, it and it looks like it could go a, a good deal longer. But yeah, definitely. Let's see. Darius says, "Hey, Uncle Adam, I've been painting a lot lately, and I'm mostly hobby to paint and to get better at painting. But I've recently been feeling stagnant and unsatisfied with my painting. Advice? Um, well, I mean, what's making you feel stagnant? Is it that?" Is it your, is it the stuff you're painting? Maybe you want to switch gears and paint. If you've only been painting sci-fi, maybe now you want to try painting some fantasy. Or if you've been only painting, um, you know, knights and and and, and um, stuff like that, maybe you should be trying to paint some more, like uh, more skin, like more barbarians, more um, elven priestesses, junk like that, and less chain mail and leather armor and stuff like that, that can be a, 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 a kind of a change. Um, maybe you want to swap between what you're painting now, maybe you're painting sci-fi now and you want to paint uh, something else like fantasy or, or steampunk or, um, you know, post-apocalyptic. That can sometimes do it. Sometimes people, if they're painting just to paint, painting one type of thing for a long time in one scale can also just be a thing that kind of drives you a little nuts. So maybe you want to switch from painting 28 millimeter models to painting like 54 millimeter models or busts or, you know, display pieces like that and stuff like that and give yourself, maybe stretch your, you know, stretch your uh, creative legs that way. I think there's also something to be said for also trying to teach yourself new techniques. If you've been painting in a certain way in the same way for a long time, like decide, you know what, I'm going to learn, I'm going to teach myself wet blending. I'm going to watch some videos and then I'm going to, you know, test it on some crap models and then try to do better and better and better and then do it on some other models and, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, teaching yourself new techniques, I think, can be important as well. Maybe stuff that you've been trying to stay away from because it seems difficult, you know, that kind of thing. I, that's, that's what I try to do if I'm, if I feel stagnant in my painting, like I've been painting the same way for a long time and that's bothering me, then I try to figure out a new, not a figure, not like discover a new way to paint, but I go and I do a little bit of research and go, you know, I should try two brush blending, or I should try, you know, doing something like highlighting more with my airbrush or, you know, whatever, that kind of stuff. There's a lot of different stuff like that. Randall says, got a game scheduled for noon. You got to take off. Thanks for the stream, Adam. Well, have a good time with your game. <clears throat> what else have we got here? John Ashley says, if your brushes and tools tend to roll off of your work surface, tape a length of sprue or something to it to prevent it from rolling off. Yeah, that's, a, that's not a bad idea. Um, I also have like a little, you know those like little wooden things that um, you put your samurai swords in? You know what I'm talking about? You, you all have samurai swords. Um, but you've seen these things before where it's like a little wooden rack that's got little kind of hooks and then you set, you know, multiple samurai swords or whatever in there. I've got uh, like a laser cut MDF, one of those four brushes. So it's yay tall roughly. And then it has spots for me, five brushes, and then you kind of set your brushes in there. Um, and that's kind of nice too. I mean, you can use just like a mug or a cup or something like that to keep your brushes in too. Um, I don't usually try to set them flat on a tabletop because A, I frequently don't have a ton of flat tabletop space. And B, for the same reason you're talking about, because they'll roll or I'll get them, set them in glue or something horrible. So yeah, definitely. 
Um, what else here? Darth Torlin says, I got tired of painting Space Marine armor, so I stopped buying, so I am purely Gaslands right now. I mean, you know, there's something really fun about just, like, modifying Matchbox cars, you know, like Hot Wheels and, and that kind of stuff, make those types of little cars. Just, like, trying to figure out, well, what can I make, what can I do to make it look like it's got a little rocket pod, you know? Or what's it got, how, how do I, how do I make a little machine gun, or, you know, like that kind of stuff. And doing that jazz... You know, putting little pieces of like mesh over the windows, like getting some like you know window screen and cutting it and trimming it, putting over the windows so it looks like they've, you know, um, welded on like a, a protection kind of grid on the front of the window so that the glass doesn't break or whatever, and doing that kind of stuff and painting those kind of cars and really beating them up and all that. That's yeah, Gaslands is a lot of fun for that, and it's a great if you want to talk about like a palette cleanser. Not a, not a wet palette cleanser, but you know what I'm talking about. Like, you've been painting the same thing for a while, and you're just like, I'm going to just paint a bunch of Matchbox cars now, and it's going to be awesome. And you do that for a bit, and you get energized, and it's great, and then you can go back to painting Space Marines or whatever and that kind of stuff. And Yeah, I think that's a, that's a lot of fun to do. Um, hey, Uncle Adam, do you think Warcry is a streamlined kill team, and do you foresee the... The two move in or branch out from other rules-wise. I don't think I quite understand that second part of that question. But the first part of the question is, do you think Warcry is a streamlined kill team? Uh, no. It's different. It is simpler than kill team, but it's not like they just took a bunch of stuff out of kill team stats and just made it even simpler. It's, it's a different thing, partially because it's a much more of a game about um, melee and hitting people as opposed to shooting at people. Kill Team is very much about shooting, and there's not nearly as much shooting in Warcry. There's some, you know, your Stormcasts have got some, um, uh, what do you call them, um, crossbows and stuff like that, you know, so uh, you've got some of that, but I think that it's, it's more of a hand-to-hand -hand combat game, and so because of that, it's a different style of game. So yeah, I, I wouldn't say it's streamlined Kill Team. Um, yeah, not 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 directly. I, honestly, I really feel like Warcry is more of a mixture between Necromunda and Kill Team, because Necromunda, in that it's got those kind of very specific warbands that you're supposed to kind of use. I mean, you can use other stuff as well, but it came with these like specific warbands, like the two that are in there plus the other four that they're going to be releasing, um, and and that's kind of along the lines of of um, Necromunda to my mind, uh, but. And then, of course, it's got the same sort of three-dimensional sort of terrain and things like that with Kill Team. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, I would, yeah, it, I would not say it's streamlined, um, Kill Team. It is simpler, certainly, than Kill Team, but. Patrick says, Adam, I have a bunch of stuff from Alpha on the other side. I've owned this stuff for some time and get no time to play it between Warm Hordes and there's hardly a meta for it, but I love my models. I think there's a big benefit to that, you know, I mean, you, you may, with with something like the other side, it's a little bit harder to build two forces so that you can teach people to play because it's a bigger army game. But for Malfo, it's very simple to build two crews at the very least and be like, hey, you know, go to the, your, your friends or your local shop or whatever and be like, would you like to learn how to play this? Um, there's, it's not difficult at all. Frankie Lee Bailey. Hey, how's it going? It says, uh, I've been working on a 3D printed brush drying rack, working on throwing in a Tabletop Minions logo on the back of it so I can uh, print 20 or 30 for TMX next year. Oh, that sounds cool. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I've seen some 3D printed uh, uh, brush, brush racks as well. I think those are pretty cool. I love seeing all the cool stuff that people are coming up with for, for our hobby in 3D printing, not just the models, but like the thing that just sets your wash in so it doesn't tip over as easily and it also... Um, you can put it in there and then, like, I've seen these things that have, like, a little arm that holds back the lid so the lid doesn't close on. You know how sometimes with GW lids, like, you're painting and then you go and it's closed? Not tight, obviously, but it's, like, fell, fallen over a little bit. Um, and so there are people who've designed, like, little cups that your wash, you know, your pot of wash sits in, but then it also holds up. And it doesn't work for any paint anyway, but it holds up the lid so you can get in there. Um, that's kind of a neat little thing, too.
Darth Tron says a plus side of buying lots of Games Workshop boxes is we have lots of extra bits. Just buy some 99 cent Hot Wheels and boom, Gaslands. That is very true too. I've held on to some bits that I've been like, hmm, when am I ever going to use this? And now I look at them and go, that'd make a great thing for Gaslands. Like, I may not use it for Games Workshop games. I may not use it for any kind of skirmish game, but this part does, if I do this to it, make it look like it's a little machine gun thing on the front of my car or a missile pod or something like that. And so that's that's very cool too. Uh, I got bored of painting Tau and Space Marines, so I decided to take full advantage of contrast paints and buy some Tyranids to paint something a bit more organic. Yeah, I mean, the contrast paints, and I'm still meaning to make a video about them, I don't know. I didn't want to just rush out and make a video about contrast when it first came out. I really wanted to kind of try to learn more about the contrast paint stuff, like myself. Um, I've been finding some contrast paints I like and some contrast paints I don't, and I've been finding some uses for contrast paints that make a lot of sense and other ones that don't. Um, organic, more organic stuff I think is really important for contrast paints. There's a lot of contrast paints out there that that only work on organic stuff. If you try to use them on Space Marines, they look like garbage, or if you know, or anything, you know, like that. Um, so yeah, it's a lot of, the, the, the contrast paints are, are interesting. There's a bunch of them that I like, and there's, there's benefits. I, like, when I'm painting Stormtroopers for Star Wars Legion right now, I'm finding that the color Black Templar, which is basically just kind of a black, works amazing on getting the, the underbody, the body glove or whatever, that, that um, Stormtroopers wear underneath the white armor. They've got this black, I don't know, I don't, it's not spandex, I'm sure, but whatever. It's underneath their, their armor. And as they're walking around in that goofy plastic armor, you can see it in between, like by the elbows, you can see it sometimes at the back, back underneath the shoulders or that kind of junk. And um, painting it with black Templar contrast color is really easy because it's so fluid, but it also covers very well. But it's not completely and totally black. Um, it works nice. It also works really good on Stormtrooper guns. Like I can just one coat, done. I've never even gone back and dry brushed, and it works really quite nicely for that. Um, but there are other colors that I'm like, nah. I like the fluidity though of it in some situations. In other situations, I don't like the fluidity of it. You know, in certain situations, depending on what you're painting. But in that situation, being able to get it into the crevices and stuff like that, it's like a, it's like a wash, except it's incredibly opaque and a bit thicker. Um, at least in that situation where I'm painting the body glove for the stormtroopers, and so I like it a lot for that. It works out super well, and it just speeds things up. Um, but not every contrast paint is um, liquid gold. You know what I mean? It's just the way it works. Uh, hello, Adam. When do you think Sisters will finally drop? Uh, before the end of 2019. I assume. They've said that uh, Emperor Willing, they're going to come out in 2019, so I will up until the end of the 31st of December, I'm going to probably keep deciding that. And then when it becomes the 1st of January, if, those, if they haven't come out yet, I'm going to be like, I'm going to bet it's 2020. I get the feeling it's coming soon. It'll probably be fall. Maybe early winter, but probably fall. So yeah, definitely. Um, what else we got here? Let me see here. For a few weeks, you couldn't throw a rock out hitting another contrast paint video on YouTube. Glad you didn't, Uncle Adam. Well, I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. It was just like, yeah, there was a lot of hay being made at that time. And I just felt, partially because, like, I got the contrast paints during TMX, the beginning of January, or uh, June. And then I was on the road for two and a half weeks. So I'm like, well, I can't do a video about contrast paints right now because I can't, I, I don't have the time to actually mess with them. Like, I'm not just gonna talk about them, really, without having mess with them. Like, as it is right now, there's still a bunch of the colors, because they sent me the entire line, and there's a bunch of the colors I haven't even cracked yet, you know, because I just haven't had the, the need to or whatever. Um, a bunch of the browns I really like. I like, like I said, the Black Templar color for certain uses. I don't think I would paint, like if I wanted to paint, paint an actual Black Templar armor, I probably wouldn't use that paint to do the entire uh, armor. But 
like if you paint Space Marines and you want, like sp specifically Space Marines, if you want that like kind of that rubbery stuff that they have like on the back of their knees and things like that, which is also kind of like the mesh underneath their armor, if you want to paint that stuff black, this stuff is amazing because it flows so nicely and it's very easy to control still. So it's great for that, but um, I wouldn't paint my Black Templars using the Black Templar color probably because I don't know that it would work as well as I could just easily do it with some spray or something like that and then some dry brush. So, um, yeah, it depends. Um, but like the Tyranids that were previously mentioned, organic stuff, um, fur, things like that, there are some real stars in that line. Um, Snakebite Leather is a great color. Um, I like the Apothecary White for when I'm doing my Stormtroopers. Um, the trick is, is that I have to, like, I paint, I prime the Stormtroopers white, I use Apothecary white on them, and then I go back and I dry brush white over it once it's dried, obviously. Um, otherwise, it does not, yeah, it's, otherwise it makes really gray, dingy looking Stormtroopers, but you go back and do that dry brush, and then it looks nice, you get nice, like, bright white on top of their helmets, on top of their shoulders, on the big flat panels, but then where all the weird little lines and the panels in their armor goes, there's this kind of gray inside there that adds this extra shadow and it, it looks pretty good. So I've been, I've been a big fan of it, yeah. Uh, John Russell says, would you use the black contrast before or after you base the rest of the trooper? Yeah, I, I start by priming the trooper white. I then use apothecary white contrast, let that dry. Then I dry brush. Then I start doing the black bits. Uh, like the the uh, the eyes, the weird little kind of headband they got going across here, the thing that they got down here in their mouth on their on their whatever, their guns, the gloves, but not the back of the hands because there's a, a, a white plastic plate that goes on the back of their hands, but they're wearing like, like black gloves. Whoops, clunked my microphone. The elbow bits. Um, one of the guys is kneeling because he's firing like a rocket launcher. His knee needs it. Um, usually, kind of around the butt area. Some of them, depending on how their armor plates are kind of moving around you might see some of that under the body glove thing. So yeah, I use it for that, but I use it after I've done all the white parts. So. Tyler says, I'm using it to get through 25 Lannister soldiers for Age of Ice, or A Song of Ice and Fire. Uh, the blood red works well. Yeah, I've heard really good things about the, there's a Blood Angels red that works really well. I've used the Flesh Terrors red on some cloaks for some hex wraiths that I painted and the jury's still out in my mind. I'm not 100% sure if I'm super happy with the result or not, um, but it depends. It, again, you know, um, it also depends a lot on the color it comes underneath. Like, I would have, if, if I decided to paint those stormtroopers using either of the primers that they tell you to use for the contrast paints, I would have been super sad because I, I needed to prime them white to make them work properly. If I would have gone with the gray sear, they would have been even dingier and grayer than, than they ended up. Um, and I want my stormtroopers to look like they've been ac in action, you know? Like, you see them walking around on the Death Star doing all their cool, I don't know, whatever they're doing over the Death Star, and they're clean. Like, everything in the Death Star is clean. But then I was just actually watching a clip from uh, A New Hope, Episode 4, the original Star Wars movie, came out in 77 or whatever, and it's the scene where they're out in the desert and they're looking for the crashed pod that had the R2 and C-3PO in it. And the stormtroopers um, are, you know, walking around in the desert looking for him. And then that guy pops up. He's like, look, sir, droids. Like, that scene. Those stormtroopers look filthy. I don't know who was working on production design that day, but it looks like someone just took a wet rag with mud on it and just rubbed it on them. I'm like, you're in the desert. Where did you find mud? It just looks weird. <laughs> so, like... Honestly, if I wanted to paint my stormtroopers to look super canon, like exactly like in the movies, I just would have put a bunch of paint on my thumbs and just rubbed it on them, and that would have looked pretty much like it looked in that particular scene in the first film. Um, so there's precedence, is what I'm saying, for having a grungy-looking stormtrooper, uh, and that's fine. So when you paint, don't worry about making them super clean, unless all the boards that you're ever going to play Star Wars Legion on are just the Death Star. Then those guys should be kind of dialed in because they're up on the big main HQ. Um, but when you're out running around out in the woods and the desert and the whatever, and the mud pits, evidently, you're, you're going to get grungy in your white plastic armor. So that's how that works. Um, what else have we got here? 
My Space Marine eye lenses never looked so good. Small area like that with the contrast is great. Yeah, because of the fluidity of it, you get this capillary action, and I've been doing it with the Stormtrooper guys because they got those black eyes, and you just get a real small brush, and you get some of that black Templar paint in there, and you just kind of touch it in there, and it just goes bloop, and it just fills up the spot because it's more flowy than, than regular paint. If you did that with wash, it would have the same capillary action, but it's a much, much more transparent um, paint. So you're going to get, you know, it's going to be like he's wearing sunglasses, but it's not going to be dark. You know, like, you know what I mean? Like, it, you, you put that stuff in there, you can, yeah. It, that stuff works really well. Like, yeah, that's another thing that contrast paint works well with, is that it is like a wash with, you get the capillary action, but it's super, super dense as far as that's concerned. Um, let's see here. Another question. Ever used Army Painter's Prime Paint Dip and Done method? I have a lot of Skaven to do and I'm considering it. So, I've not used Army Painter's... Well, that's not true. I've used Army Painter's Dip, but it's been a very long time. I've not used it in a long time. Some of my earliest models after the Battletech ones that I was talking about at the beginning of the show, some of my earliest models were done using dip, but it was before Army Painter, I think, was a company. So I was using Minwax from the hardware store, which is a good deal thicker than the stuff that Army Painter makes. Now, all that being said, they refer to it as a dip. I personally believe that you should never dip. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't use that stuff. I'm saying you should not actually physically dip it into the can. Number one, when I was using Minwax, I can't tell you how many times I dropped the model into the can. I don't know what my problem was. I'm holding it with like a, a needle nose pliers or something and you're like blurp and then just it, and it falls in and then you're trying to get it out. It's a giant pain in the rear. So don't do that. Um, second problem is is that you then have an amazing amount of dip fluid stuck to your model and then when you take that model out and you dr set it down it all starts to run via gravity and then now like around their ankles all these creatures have an amazing amount of shadow, you know, because all of the dark color has run down to like, especially if you're wearing like, like pants, like some of my earliest models were these guys and they were like military type guys and they had like, um, you know, kind of slightly baggier, like fatigue pants. And when I dipped them and then set them down, like all of the dip went down into the crevices and the, the folds in their pants and they just looked terrible. So, uh, don't do that. Um, what you should do instead with that stuff, if you're going to use it, is brush it on. So you do your prime and you do your base coloring and then you brush on the dip and you have a lot more control over it. And then you can go back and highlight it and touch it up afterwards. I like a lot of the Army Painter brush, or the Army Painter paints, I like Army Painter brushes too. But a lot of the Army Painter paints I like quite a bit and the primers and all that kind of jazz. Um, but these days I generally don't dip. Now if I had a huge project, if I had 50 or 100 of the same model, I would probably look hard into doing it. Again, I would not dip it in the can. I would still just brush the stuff on because you get a bit more control. Um, but on the other hand, I might find another process where I end up just trying to figure out a way to do it with something else. Um, you know, more of a Zenithal highlight with a rattle can or an airbrush or something like that. Or there's, there's other possibilities. Um, even just their own washes, honestly. Like the Army Painter washes are also great. So you could just, instead of using dip, you could use the wash. It's the same thing. You prime, you base coat, you wash, you go back and do some dry brush. That's a good looking model already. Tabletop, you know what I mean? So yeah, something to look at there. Um, one of the big benefits of the dip though, at least of that material, again, not necessarily actually dunking it in there, but, but painting it on, is it's got a good deal of for lack of a better term, polyurethane. Um, so it's very protective of the model. It's also very glossy, so if you don't like gloss, you're gonna have to go back and dry, you know, uh, put a bit matte varnish on it. But um, it will protect that paint. <laughs> like, those, those initial models that I did where I actually did dip them in there, that paint will never come off. I don't know that even, like, a really strong, like, maybe brake fluid might get eat through there, but yeah, it, you're not gonna have to worry about chipping those models on, on the tabletop, you know what I mean? <clears throat> um, Brandon Bailey says, I never played Kill Team, but it sounds like it lends itself to more customization and creativity from a modeling perspective. I'm concerned that Warcry models, excuse me, and their gear are a bit too prescribed. Well, that's part of the simplicity. Um, you're not wrong, though, as far as like 
kill team is much more customizable and war cry is less so but that's part of making those two games not be exactly the same game but just one's fantasy and one sci-fi <clears throat> excuse me i think my voice is starting to go a little bit um yeah so that's that's you're not wrong there um legionnaire says i dipped once and the model is still sticky yeah that's also an issue too it takes forever to dry JP Got Rockets is better to paint on the dip rather than actually dipping the model. <clears throat> Excuse me, something in my throat. Ah, all right. John Ashley Smith says, wondering if there will be a set of selected colors of the contrast paints. I don't like the idea of only single bottles. Kind of pricey to get a decent selection. Um, I mean, yeah, they may sell it. I would almost guarantee there will probably not be much of a discount. Sometimes, like, the start collecting boxes, when you look at those start collecting boxes they sell, those are generally a very good discount. Like if you were to buy all those models separately, they would cost more than the start collecting boxes. But they also sometimes have kits where they're like, hey, you just saved a bunch of clicks. Like, because you only had to click once to buy this. And you're like, well, how much money did I save? They're like, none. It's exactly the same retail price, but you only had to click once. So that you saved something there. Um, and I bet that they would probably, I, I could be wrong, but I don't know that they would sell kits of the paints to be cheaper. They might. Um, I personally like the fact that they're selling them separately so that I can pick and choose and say, I just want this color and this color. Because again, if you're not buying, like if you buy the entire line just to have them, the downside is that you might find some colors you're like, I can't ever think of a place where I would actually use this. Now that I've tried it a couple of times, I don't think it's maybe as good of a color as I would like, or I don't paint that type of model. It would be great if I was doing this, but I don't do that. Like skeleton horde color. Like if you're not painting any skeletons, and you might not necessarily need that color. You know what I mean? There might be other things you could use it on, like bone, maybe teeth, claws, things like that. But it's not necessarily giving you a huge bonus in that situation. You know, you could also do that with other types of paints. But, you know what I mean? Like, so, with the skeleton bone, or, sorry, skeleton horde is what the, the, the color is called. If you were going to be painting a whole skeleton, it speeds up the process considerably. But if you're just painting the claws on a creature, you could also just do that with a, ble a bleach bone style color and maybe a quick wash and then boom. So yeah, you know, um, I, I think that putting putting them all together into big kits where you have to buy the entire kit, A, they're probably not going to be much of a discount. They might, but they might not. Um, and B, you know, I guess it's it's a kind of a horse apiece. It depends on, at that point, you're probably buying them like, I don't know that they would go through the, the, the thing of packaging them in boxes and selling the boxes separately. They may have a thing on the website where you can click here and then we'll send you, you know, these dozen colors and then you'll just get them in a plastic baggie. But going into the store and buying a cool box, like then they have to produce the box and there's cost in producing the box and doing the artwork for the box and the UPC and all that other junk, they may not find a big benefit to doing that. Plus then... The game store has to find the shelf place to put this. They've already got all the paints separately, but now they've got to find a place to put this box of paints. And you know, so hard to say, but I bet not. Um, let's see here. May Fleet Armada says I've been using a lot of contrast. Never had any problems with the paint rubbing off because I use empty paint pots to hold the models, so I don't touch the models directly. Yeah, I use them. Um, Actually, mainly I use the GW gripper well, little handle things lately. I like those quite a bit, as it turns out. Um, yeah, I haven't had any rub off either, but then again, I've not been... I don't usually rub my models too much, so there's that. Like, I generally varnish nearly everything, and I. but I have heard people say that once dry, the contrast can... Because it's, I mean, when the contrast is working properly... It is pulling itself away almost from the sharper detail edges. Like when you slop the stuff on there, like they tell you one thick coat, the idea is that it's going to like flow down into the lower areas to make a shadow, but it's also going to pull away like from the pointy bits that stick up to make almost an edge highlight. Well, in doing that, it's probably making itself incredibly thin in those detail 
parts. And then if you pick up the model and you rub your fingers across the detail parts, there's very little substrate left there to, you know, protect the color underneath and then it can rub off. And that makes sense. Um, again, I just generally try not to touch the models too much until I varnish them. So that's something to think about as well. Because yeah, if you're a person who does not varnish models that you play on the tabletop with, even regular paint, you're gonna rub off eventually. But I think that contrast paint, especially the raised edges, are gonna, is gonna rub off even more easily from what I can tell. Billy Mark says, using contrast paints for my zombicide models, thinking that painting a horde of zombies would be quick. Not sure if green primer would have been faster. Surprisingly, the, the huge minotaur came, came out great. Uh, Sam was painting a bunch of his zombicide stuff using the, the contrast paints, actually. Um, yeah, I, I think that the, that stuff would work pretty well. Um, I think that potentially, though, you could also do just like some colored primer and then some washes and some regular paints and get along in that same area. But then you need colored primer, you need washes, and you need some other paints. Whereas if you're just using, like, the, uh, part of the idea of contrast paints is that if you're just starting out, frequently some of these colors are the only colors you might need. Like if you were doing um, Black Plague Zombicide, which is the more medieval version, you might need some metallics for some swords and daggers and stuff like that. But, and then in that situation, you're, you're going to use normal, normal metallic paints, not contrast, because they don't, I don't even think they make a contrast metallic really at all. Um, in that situation, yeah, you know, you might want to be able to kind of mix those things together, but in like normal Zombicide, you could probably paint those models completely in contrast if you wanted to, just to get them done, because there's so many of them. But again, like I said, you could also prime them all green and then do some washes and do some, some, some touch up and some dry brush and be done. Um, there's lots of different ways to kind of like figure out that trick, whether you're using contrast paints, whether you're using regular paints, whether you're using airbrush, you know, rattle can. Um, there's a lot of different things. Like, you know, you could go to the hardware store and buy the Krylon camouflage spray paint. There's six different colors. There's two of them that are like an olive drab. There's like a lighter one and a darker one. You buy that lighter color olive drab and then you spray them all green with that stuff. And then you take the, maybe the um, lighter kind of um, khaki color that they make as well, and then just dust them from above. And now you've got this skin tone that goes from like a light sort of kind of pasty tan, and then in all the darker and underneath areas, it starts to fade to a green. And that's gonna look like a zombie kind of right off the bat, and you've done nothing except spray them twice. And then you can go in and do some wash, do a little bit of touch up details here and there, do a little bit of dry brush and be done. So, you know, Again, you're buying several cans of rattle can and all that kind of stuff as opposed to just getting maybe three or four pots of um, contrast colors. But if you just painted your entire zombie horde with only three or four colors, they're going to look pretty samey. So, you know, there's there's different options and, you you know, it's pretty impossible to sit down and paint an entire group of zombicide and make them look really good with only like one brush and like four paints. It's just, it, you're going to have to invest a bit more than that to kind of get there, sadly. Well, not sadly. I think it's a good hobby and it's a lot of fun, but it can be daunting to a beginner to be like, I have to buy how many paints, you know? Um, so yeah. Uh, Nishana says, my rattle can white turned out always a bit grainy, even the best tries. Yeah, white rattle can is almost always a bit grainy. My first Stormtrooper squad that I did, I decided to try a white rattle can real quick, and it came out pretty dusty, pretty grainy. I think that's just part of white primer, uh, white rattle can primer. I mean, it's also like how close you are, um, it has to do with humidity sometimes. Um, white primers in general, I have a hard time with. Like, when I'm, even when I'm using my airbrush, I have to add flow improver to it, because otherwise it'll dry on the tip a lot more. Whereas if I use gray or black or any other color of primer, it never dries out on the tip as, as quickly as the white primer does. So um, I'm sure there's a scientific reason uh, for that, but I'm not a scientist, particularly so. <clears throat> uh, let's see here. Alexis says, I'm doing 1,500 points of Death Guard in three days of contrast. It can certainly be done. And there are certain models that lend themselves better to it. You know what I mean? Um, 
you know, Death Guard, definitely, you can easily use some Death Guard, you know, some of those greens, because some of the greens are really good in the contrast colors, and go, you know, boom, and then go back and do some other stuff. And they can, you know, Nurgle needs to look a little messy, so it makes sense. But if you were going to say, I'm going to paint 1,500 points of um, high elves, you know, or something like that uh, with contrast, I good luck a little bit like that for that quickly. That'd be hard, I think. Um, definitely. Um, let's see. We've got a vote here for Army Painter's Flat Spray Varnish. We've got another vote here for... Um, Vallejo matte varnish through an airbrush. Lately I use, it's made by AK, Inter, AK Interactive and it's a little bit harder to find. Uh, I got mine on eBay, eBay I think. Uh, but AK Interactive makes something called Ultra Matte Varnish that I shoot through my airbrush and it is sweet. It works really, really well. Um, Let's see here. How about a varnish for those of us who don't have an airbrush? Um, I would also tell you to look for, at your local hobby store, if you can find it, uh, Testers. Testers is a company that's been around forever. They're the ones that make the little square or glass bottles of, a, of uh, enamels that I was talking about earlier at the beginning of the show. Um, that you paint your model airplanes and your model cars with when you're a kid. Uh, they make something called Dull Coat in a rattle can, and it's also very good. It's, it used to be my go-to until I got the AK Interactive stuff. Other people here also saying uh, testers dull coat. Yep, that's that's a good stuff too. Um, Paul says that rattle can varnishing in the wrong weather can be disastrous. That is also true. That is one of the downsides of rattle can varnishing is that if the weather's not right, if it's like say too humid and stuff like that, you can really fog the model. It'll get real frosty looking. So that's a problem. So it depends on where you live. Um, let me see here. Citadel Ard Coat brushes on pretty good for a varnish. I use Ard Coat as a gloss. Yeah, that works quite well for a varnish. Um, when I'm painting like Nurgle again, uh, if I want like some of the guts that are hanging out and the, the sores and all the other gross Nurgle stuff, when I want it to look like it's still wet, I go back with some Ard Coat after I've done all of my dry varnish and all that stuff, my, my matte varnish, and then I paint on little spots of that glossy stuff and it makes the model look like it's still wet in spots and that's when you're trying to make uh, Nurgle stuff look gross, make it look like it's still wet and that, that helps. Um, Land of the Fallen Sword, so is Warcry our replacement for Mordheim? I, no, I would say not. I don't think that, um, I don't think there is a replacement for, War, for Mordheim. If anything, kind of like we were talking about before, it's kind of a fantasy version of it's a fantasy version of Kill Team, but with simpler rules, but more campaign rules, which is interesting. So there's a much more fleshed out campaign system in Warcry than there is in, in, in Kill Team, but the rules for Warcry are a good deal simpler than the rules for, for Kill Team. So it's interesting that way. Um, but it is, I would say, in no way really does it seem like it's more time. I mean, to be honest, really, Mordheim, a lot of Mordheim is also the, the theme. Like, this is all basically, Warcry is basically about pit fighters trying to kill each other, for the most part. Whereas, you know, Mordheim is about bands of treasure hunters. And, you know, kind of. And so, that's really the difference, I think, that, that is, you know, important. <clears throat> Let's see here. Got another vote here for AK Ultramat. It's the best one I tried, says Kim. Well, yeah, I, I like it a lot, too. Um, what else have we got here? The Warcry campaign system reminds me a lot of Blood Bowl. Interesting. Hmm, I'll have to take a look at it again. I hadn't really... I guess I haven't looked super heavy at the Blood Bowl campaign. Like, more, normally when we play Blood Bowl, it's just like one-off games. I guess I haven't looked at that. Um, hmm, interesting, yeah. Well, uh, it is 11 o'clock in my neck of the woods, so um, I want to thank everybody for coming out to the show. Uh, I didn't want to jinx it before, but I just realized that for some reason my camera did not freak out the entire time in this episode. 
which is amazing. If you've been watching the last couple of episodes, the camera will sometimes go off and go back on again, and it's really dumb. Sometimes I have to unplug it, plug it back in again, and I don't know what happened. So evidently it's fixed. Who knows? Anyway, um, uh, one more time, just for, for grins, if you're interested, we, uh, uh, you, uh, the, you can't see me again. Um, there is a sale being put on on the t-shirt store, offer code SUNSHINE at checkout. You're going to get 10% off until tonight, uh, at basically at midnight uh, Pacific time. So, you know, anyway. Um, and this shirt, this sale is actually put on by the manufacturer who makes my shirts. So, um, the big benefit is that, like, I still get the, it's not me taking that 10% hit, it's them taking the 10% hit which is why I don't have any control over like when the, the sale is or why it's sunshine instead of something more fun for a keyword, but that's what it is. So if you're interested, you can go to bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash Merch Bunker and get some cool shirts that might look like this or also like that. Uh, you've seen with the end of the shows, but there's more than just this design. There's several designs and more designs coming eventually, but not right now. Um, so yeah, offer code sunshine, you can do that. And then lastly, uh, for those of you who are gonna be at Gen Con, I hope to see you there. Uh, I'm planning on having a meetup on Friday night, probably around 8.30 p.m. Um, they'll put, I'll put more details on like Facebook and junk like that so that people can um, hopefully attend and hang out and say hi and whatever. But otherwise, if you're busy doing stuff, I at least hope to bump into you at Gen Con and say, you know, we'll, we'll say hi or whatever. But anyway, um, next show is in two weeks and I will be just back from Gen Con and then I'll talk about probably Gen Con stuff then and whatnot. Um, so keep an eye on Instagram. I'll probably be posting a bunch of stuff there, but I might post some videos as well, actually from Gen Con. So we'll see how that goes. Anyway, again, I appreciate you folks coming by and um, and saying hi and asking questions and, and saying and talking to each other, the community, when people are asking questions and other people in the chat are answering. That's awesome too, because that's what I'm trying to foster. So anyway, um, we'll see you in another two weeks. Thanks for watching.